In this fifth lecture module, I'm going to talk about metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks are those that have undergone a change in texture and possibly the mineralogy as a result of the application of heat and pressure. Now, the important thing to remember is that this change, whether it's texture or mineralogy, occurs in a solid state, meaning the minerals within the rock remain solid. They don't melt and become liquid. So this makes metamorphic rocks differ substantially from igneous rocks that cool from a liquid. In the metamorphic process, the rocks change without ever turning into liquid. So let's start by taking a look at a complicated metamorphic rock. This is an outcrop or an exposure of the rock called schist. Now schist is a foliated metamorphic rock. And foliation here is represented as the lines of or alternating layers of dark and light minerals. Now in some ways this looks like the bedding that you saw in sedimentary rocks but it's a completely different process. In sedimentary rocks uh, parallel layers are deposited as detrital sediments settle out of either wind or water and the, it, the rock builds up in layers. In this case when the rock was formed this banding was not there but then the rock was subjected to heat and pressure and during this heating and pressure process the actual minerals changed and began to segregate into these roughly parallel layers of light and dark minerals. That process of the separation into these foliation bands is a metamorphic process. So now if we look closer at this rock, I mean it's really complicated. If we look at the blue circle, we see a dark portions of the rock, veins that are injected throughout the rock. In the yellow area, we see a clump or cluster of light-colored minerals. And then over in the red circle, we see these convoluted bands of alternating light and dark minerals. And we see that the, across this outcrop, the rock changes in texture substantially from one side to the other. It's a very complicated system. And metamorphic rocks tend to be very complicated. In fact, if you look at the 4,000 plus minerals that are found in nature, the bulk of them are found mostly or only in metamorphic rocks. So in this course, we just touch on metamorphic rocks fairly lightly and deal with the basic processes. So let's take a look at the process um, by which new minerals form from old ones without melting. I'm sure all of us have done pottery at some time in our lives, and perhaps still do. When you make a pot, you take clay, you make it wet in order to make it pliable, you shape it into a form, and then you put it in a kiln to heat it or fire the clay. When you're first working with the clay, as you continue to work it, it will become drier. It will dry out and crack. So you wet it up a little bit, it absorbs the water and then becomes smooth and soft again and you can go back to shaping it. Then after you put it in the kiln it heats it up to a very high temperature and it allows it to stay there for several hours. When you cool it it's now a pot. You can put water in it. The water is not absorbed and the pot doesn't become pliable and soft. What's changed here? Well, actually the minerals have, themselves have changed. Clay minerals are unstable at high temperature. They, I don't want to say break down, they change, they go through a crystallization process and become the mica minerals. So when you take this clay, with a little bit of water in it, you heat it up, the water is driven off, and the minerals change into the mica minerals. The mica minerals are impervious to water so you can put water in the pot when you're done. This process which in which new minerals are formed at elevated temperature or pressure is called neocrystallization, new crystals. The old minerals are unstable 
and they change into something that is stable at high temperature. In terms of rocks, we refer to the, the original material as the protolith, or parent rock. In this analogy, the clay is the protolith. When we take the, clay, the pot out, it's no longer made of clay, it's made of mica minerals. We call that the metamorphic product. So the kiln makes a really good analogy for how metamorphosis works and uh, the mineral change that happens at elevated temperature. Now if we look at conditions in the earth, we don't, we don't only have temperature, we also have pressure. Both of them affect the metamorphic process. Now if you look at this complicated chart here, on the left hand side you see pressure which is measured in kilobars. One bar is equal to the pressure at atmospheric. So the pressure that we're subjected to every day is one bar. Now it seems like we're not under pressure of the air, it's not a heavy weight on us, but the re fact is it's the equivalent to 33 feet of water. So one bar of pressure is equal to being 33 feet under water. So that's really a lot of pressure. We don't feel it because we were born in it, we were raised in it, we're subject at, subjected to it every day, so the pressure doesn't affect us. That's one bar. A kilobar is a thousand, so a thousand times the pressure of being on the surface of the earth is one kilobar. If we look at the horizontal axis, you'll see temperature in degrees centigrade from zero to a little over 1100. Remember, 100 degrees centigrade is the temperature at which water boils, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The scale on the right is depth in the earth, and that's equivalent to kilobars. So it's the deeper you go in the earth, the more kilobars of pressure you feel. So now if we look at this chart, we see on the upper left hand corner an area that's labeled lithification of sedimentary rocks. And remember, in order for sedimentary rocks to become compacted and cemented together, they have to be buried and under pressure. So at depths of up to, say, 10 kilometers beneath the surface of the earth, and at temperatures up to 200 degrees centigrade, that's the standard temperatures and pressures that lead to the lithification of sedimentary rocks. If the pressure gets higher or the, the temperature gets higher than those values, we start to enter the metamorphic range. And metamorphism ranges from low grade to medium to high grade. And the, more, the higher the grade, the more change that the rock undergoes. So low grade metamorphism, shown here, is a range of temperatures and pressures under which the rocks change in a similar fashion. For the temperature and pressures in the, between the two dotted black lines that say medium grade, which is also referred to as intermediate grade, you see a different set of changes at intermediate grade. At high grade, you see very substantial changes to the rock. And the yellow line on the far right hand side is the point at which dry granite melts. So along that line, at different pressures, is with the temperature at which dry granite melts. So metamorphism occur, occurs at the temperatures and pressures between lithification on the left hand side and the magma line on the right. At temperatures and pressures between there, the rocks undergo change. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this lecture and the, re the results, uh, the rocks that result from that process. So let's talk first about texture. Uh, we're going to talk about neocrystallization, which is new crystals forming, and foliation. Let's start off with a randomly distributed um, crystals in a rock. And you saw that in granite. Now granite's not a great example because it's not subjected to low grade metamorphism or intermediate grade, but it is subjected to high grade metamorphism. So if we take a granite with randomly distributed crystals and we put it under pressure and temperature high enough, say high grade metamorphism, that 
the minerals become unstable and change into new minerals. Now some of those new minerals will be oriented, meaning they'll have either be either flat like the micas or tabular like feldspars. What will happen then is that those par mineral particles, when they reform, the new crystals will form perpendicular to any applied pressure. So if we take the, the highest pressure that's pushing in on this rock, the new crystals will form perpendicular to that pressure. So they will all be oriented. That's the formation of foliation. Basically, the crystals are growing in the least possible, where there's the least possible resistance, which is perpendicular to the principal stress or principal force acting on that rock. Okay. So that's the metamorphic effect on texture. Now, if we look at how the texture changes from low grade to intermediate grade to high grade, the crystals get bigger as we increase the metamorphic grade, as we increase the temperature and pressure, individual crystals become larger. If we look at the degree of foliation, foliation is subtle within low-grade metamorphic rocks and it becomes increasingly distinct as the grade of metamorphism increases. So if we start off with a simple sedimentary rock like shale, shale's mudstone, little tiny particles of clay, kind of like the pot we're going to fire. Well, we take that clay, we subject it to heat and pressure, low-grade heat and pressure, it turns into the metamorphic rock slate then more heat and pressure we get phyllite which is another metamorphic rock then as we cross the line to an intermediate grade level of heat and pressure we start to see the clear light and dark banding of the minerals in the rock schist then we move on to with high grade metamorphic rocks we find nice where we have very distinct banding and finally, at the highest grade of metamorphism, we have a rock called migmatite. And we'll talk about those rocks individually later in, the, in this lecture. Now, for recrystallization, which is the formation of a crystal without changing the mineralogy, meaning it starts out as quartz, it finishes as quartz, starts out as calcite, it finishes in calcite. So in rocks where there's a really simple mineralogy and, ro and minerals that don't tend to separate and form new minerals under heat, we, tend we get non-foliated metamorphic rocks. So for example, sandstone that's made of quartz, the only thing, the change that undergoes is where we, it, we begin with separate grains that are separated by pore spaces and cemented together. So we have these little holes in sandstone. What happens during recrystallization is the solid particles move around, the minerals move around a little bit and fill in the holes. So we end up getting a pure rock of quartz that's pure quartz where we have intergrown quartz crystals. And if you look at this image on the right of quartzite, you'll see three crystals coming together, these triple junctions where the crystals join. That's sure there's no, no open space, no place for water to go. The individual sand particles have grown together to fill that open space when they were subjected to heat and pressure. The same thing happens during the transformation of limestone into marble. Now limestone is generally made up of the shell fragments of tiny microscopic critters. Now, the, the picture here, or the image, the drawing here, is a caricature, of course, of shells. The shells are really simple. They're all usually, they're usually all identical because the same critters lived and died in the same place. The point is, when that rock's subjected to heat and pressure, that the mineral calcite changes around in, in, solid, in the solid state and fills in all the gaps and holes and we end up getting a solid intergrown calcite crystals. There's no void spaces in the rock. We call this recrystallization. In both of these cases, 
there's no segregation of light and dark minerals. The mineral crystals have no preferred orientation. Um, sandstone does not form tabular or flat crystals, neither does calcite. So there's no preferred orientation, there's no foliation in the system. Metamorphism, heat and pressure, also affects the minerals that are present. So if we look at low, medium, and high grade uh, metamorphism, we find that certain minerals are stable for low grade, at low grade metamorphism, others are stable across a wide range. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, the mineral quartz is really is stable basically all the way up to the point it melts. Feldspars are present throughout the whole metamorphic range, but the mineral chlorite is only found in low-grade metamorphic rocks. Chlorite is a product of the metamorphism of clay minerals. The chlorite's only found, it's a mica mineral, it's only find, found in low-grade metamorphic rocks. The other micas, muscovite and biotite, are found at different grades of metamorphism. The mineral garnet is found only in medium high grade metamorphic rocks. So, and it is found only in metamorphic rocks. Starlite, kyanite, sylmanite, other minerals that are only found in metamorphic rocks. So we can look at from this chart, if you hand me a metamorphic rock, if I can identify the minerals in it, I can determine whether it was low, medium, or high grade metamorphism because those minerals are indicative of the grade of metamorphism. For example, chlorite is very useful as an index mineral. It's indicative of low grade metamorphism. Starlite is an index mineral that tells me that it was a medium grade or intermediate grade of metamorphism. And sylmanite, sylmanite tells me that it was high grade metamorphism. So now that we've talked about the grades of metamorphism, we've talked about the textural changes that occur and the mineralogic changes that occur, we're, next thing we'll do is talk about the places where metamorphism occurs.